uh, Sean Adams, a, a local media expert, will come up and share his experiences. And after that, we'll have a day one wrap up led by uh, Adam Troy. Is Adam in the house? I thought I saw him a minute ago. OK, Adam Troy in the back. All right, Sean, stage is yours. All right. If you can hear me, okay. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Sean Adams. I was a, um, and I'm gonna, well, I'll let some people transition for a second. I, um, I've had a different experience and I had a different entry point into the media as well. And I wanna, I wanna start with a very simple point. If you work with student athletes, if you work with um, scholarship athletes, they owe the media nothing. Uh, they owe the media nothing. I am a, uh, I guess I'm a bona fide member of the media. I came through it through a very different way. My undergrads in finance and economics have an MBA in merger and acquisition, and I was a CEO for a while and was a former scholarship athlete and decided I wanted to be in sports. And there is a, um, there's been a change in the media. And uh, back when I was competing in 89 to 93, uh, you usually had a 24-hour news cycle. You had one outlet, and it was usually a newspaper. And that's the medium you dealt with. And if that medium was OK, and that medium was satisfied, and sometimes they were in cahoots with said university or said coach, then everything was great. And if they weren't, then you weren't. We have turned into the 1920s, you know, 60 newspapers in New York where uh, people make stuff up in order to get their paper sold. And when they get their paper sold, that means they won. And any guy in his grandmom's basement is all of a sudden a member of the media now. We have the internet. And I'm not mad at the barrier to entry because I got into it a different way. I didn't take the journalism route. But the media is very different. If you notice stories now in the media, there is a mean-spiritedness to the media. It's not about reporting. And that's why when I'm trying to work with athletes, I'm always, one, I'm trying to get them to understand again, and I'm going to say it a lot during this thing. The athletes owe the media nothing. Not a thing. Media has become part of the story. It used to be reporting. It used to be a lot of reporting, and there would be unbiased media. Now, because we were back in the 1920s, everything's an op-ed piece. Sure, there's some quotes in there. Sure, there's some interview pieces in there. And sure, they're going to talk to you about what they did against the five wide receiver set. But there's a lot of opinion. And you know what the opinion does? It gets you clicks, and it gets you retweets, and it gets you everything you need to make the money you want to make. So that presents a very special challenge to the student athlete, and in particular, the black and brown student athletes that might not feel secure. They already come to campus, and they already feel challenged like they might not be in a place where they fit. I encourage athletes all the time to branch out. I'm a fan of the study abroad programs. I was never, never able to do it. I was a full scholarship athlete and I played two sports. So I couldn't travel in the fall, couldn't travel in the spring. But it is trips like those that help build confidence. Confidence is what helps you beat back aggressive reporters. But you have to be able to build that. So I will employ you first to empower your student athletes. Empower them how to answer questions. Empower, empower them how to answer questions without impugning their own teammates and their own coaches. A lot of athletes walk around every single day and they're scared of the media. When really, I'm just like everybody else. The media is eating off the athlete as well. All those clicks, all those stories, that's everything that they have. 
So when you're dealing with the media, I think the empowering side of the conversation is about having a conversation about what you can do to make sure you lead the charge in how you deal with the media. And of course, I'm based here in Austin, and it's pretty difficult because you get a large number of people in a room, and there's social media involved, and I'll get to that in a second. But when you have all these things going on around you, somebody has to help the student athlete navigate the process. I sit at press conferences here on Monday sometimes when the football coach and some of the players meet with the media, and I sit there and cringe. You have a large group of people. My college coach told me, those that can do, those that can't don't, or coach, and those that could do neither one of those, grab a pen and join the media. And that's who you're dealing with every day. And I'm just being honest with you here, and I'm a, I, I know I'm a member of the media. My co-host on my radio show gets mad at me all the time because he says I'm always banging the media. And I am banging the media. But you have a group of people that are covering the student athletes that you work with that, one, usually aren't athletes, two, are probably in a state of where they're jealous of the things that happen with the student athlete. And three, they don't like them. And I don't want to be cynical about that. I think that's a real thing. Just like we talked about the picture that is shown for people about student athletes, many members of the media feel the same way. And they put this kid in a box with these certain characteristics about him. And I'll say this, a lot of people didn't know what to do with me when I got to a, what you call it, a PWI, predominantly white institution, all right. That's where I went to school. <laughs> so, um, but people didn't know I'd handle me. I'm a kid from Oakland, California. I had earrings in, tattoos, but I was in a business honors program and they couldn't figure out how to, what box does this joker go in? Students have to be empowered. And if there's anything that I, I know, we talk about the media from a standpoint of, Protect yourself against this. Protect yourself against this. Don't protect them. Empower them. It's perfectly OK for a student athlete to say, I don't want to answer that question. It's perfectly OK. But they have to be told that, and people have to be OK with that. And there are enough great people that are in the media that will help that situation along. So let me get to social media. Everybody talks about social media from a standpoint of what you shouldn't do. Oh, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do this. And a lot of those things are very true. The one thing that the student athletes need to know that work with you is that while they're student athletes, they may not have a better branding and networking opportunity that exists to them. People care what they think because they care about the sports. At some point, you have to leverage that sport into building something for you. There are plenty of techniques that can be used in social media that will allow the student athlete, again, to empower themselves, to grow, develop, and evolve so that they can be complete people later. The characteristics that you learn from being an athlete, many of it from working with the media, learning how to present yourself, learning how to communicate, all those things equals jobs, jobs, jobs. Now, we live in a culture where a lot of times some universities, even some coaching staffs around this country, yes, don't understand the virtue of the difference between eligibility and education. There's a vast difference between eligibility and education. But there's a whole lot of ways to educate. And if we can figure out how to empower young people, because again, they owe the media nothing. Perfectly okay for a student athlete to say, yeah, I don't want to answer that question. And I just thought, uh, if there's a media member from a local newspaper, so what? Let them get upset. We have to work with our student athletes so they're okay with people not being pleased with an answer they give. I think sometimes, sometimes somebody will ask a student athlete a question and they answer the question 
And they're kind of talking through trying to find an answer until the media member is satisfied. And if the media member's still looking at him like this, they keep talking. They don't have to do that. But they will only learn that, and they will only take charge of that if you teach them to. It's just like anything else, learning how to manage the media, learning how to manage the expectations, learning how to manage the people around them that will empower them in so many different ways in their lives, but it will also keep them safe from some of the vultures that are out there reporting in media. Now, do I have to say some things sometimes that aren't pleasant? Yes. I decided in my career when I got started that I wouldn't say things that were personal. If I disagree with somebody does from a, from a offensive perspective, I'm not banging on them. I didn't agree with this. But it's very much like our political system now. I'm not saying it was great 30 years ago, but if you look back at our political system 30 years ago, sometimes if there was a different disagreement between the aisles, it was, yeah, we don't agree on that. I think that's, that's, a, that's a bad policy. But now we've decided that they're bad people. So now we look at young people and say, he made this mistake, he said this wrong, we have social media, it's being tweeted out from a press conference, and now all of a sudden 100,000 people have it around the country and somebody's trying to figure out if they can grab something off Twitter. The only way to control it is not to set in rules. I'm not diming out Mike Leach from when he was at Texas Tech, and he said, I'm taking all my kids off social media, you can't do it. Les Miles had a, a player stabbed the other night at LSU. And he decided he's banning all the student athletes from bars. <laughs> I was a student athlete for a long time, fairly successful student athlete. I've never once almost been stabbed. <laughs> we have to empower young people with great choices, but we don't help them if we try to control them. We don't help them by saying, hey, I, you're not allowed to bars anymore because somebody got stabbed. We have to help young people make better decisions and think forward. I tell athletes all the time, begin with the end in mind. And if you do that, then maybe you'll make a few, uh, a few better choices. Um, and I'm going to end it again the way I started it. The best message that your student athletes can learn is that they don't owe the media anything. The media is eating off them. If the, if the media member doesn't get any meat for his story for Monday for the newspaper, who cares? It doesn't matter. The student athlete needs to be in control of the conversation. Is it a daunting task sometimes? Yes, but I think it can be done with great training and when you communicate with student athletes and when you have people that work with student athletes that care about the future. Leonard, I'm done. Thank you all very much. Can we give Sean Adams another round of applause? It, it, it really uh, gives me uh, great honor to bring up, uh, and, and it's interesting when you're an adult and say you have a close friend for 30 years. I'm not trying to, try to put a, a, a time on us, but it, 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 time doesn't lie. Um, I want to bring up a, a, a good friend and someone who is a great example of someone who has been a successful student athlete. Uh, he was a, a star point guard at uh, Morehouse College and then used that leverage uh, to go on and create a successful um, uh, enterprise to do good in the community. And I'm not gonna steal any of his thunder, but I want him to be able to share that and then use that as an opportunity to end uh, the forum today. So I bring up Adam Troy. Y'all all right? Y'all all right? Yeah. Come on now, I had to get up at four o'clock this morning. Dr. Williams, jump on a flight at 5.15, stop through Charlotte, get here, and then had to be ready to come here five minutes after I got here. Y'all right? Yes, sir. Huh? And then they pulled an audible on me. The thing I was supposed to present on, I ain't presenting on. Huh? So y'all right? Yes, sir. Wonderful. Here's what we're going to do. Don't y'all hate coming to these things, and they feel kind of stiff sometimes, and you get tired of talking to one another. And those who know me know I'm fairly radical. 
So now that I had a mic, that's, that's kind of a dangerous thing. So we at the end of the day, I do understand that there is wisdom and brevity. And this says, uh, reception at what time? Reception at what time? And what time is it now? Y'all can't, y'all can't tell time, can't you? What time is it? All right. So listen, some of y'all have been sitting next to the same person, right, all afternoon. Stand up, greet the person. Tell them they're glad that they're still here. Let's just do that real quick. Shake off some of it. Got to stand up and do it. Got to stand up and do it. No sitting down. Got to stand up and do it. no convention. Some of y'all having a convention, right? So listen, listen, listen up. Just stop talking right where you are. Stop talking right where you are, because y'all feel kind of far from me, so here's what I want you to do. If you are beyond the fourth row, beyond the fourth row, everybody beyond the fourth row, just raise your hand. Move up two rows. Y'all just kind of far from me. I came all, you can, at least you could do is move up a couple rows. Just move up a couple rows. Now you didn't got to know the person in front of you to the side of you. Scotty Graham always negotiate, man. If fourth row, move up two rows. If I said I'm gonna give you $3 million, you figured out how to move, wouldn't you? That's all right, stay in the fifth row, man. All right. Do what you can. Y'all still all right? So listen, I got a couple of, of, of disclosures real quick. Um, Y'all do this for me. Just clap in advance. Clap in advance. And we've had some great presentations, and I've noticed some of y'all don't know when to clap. And some of y'all just don't know when to clap. So I'm having you clap for this cat uh, on the front side. Um, in fact, let, let me dial back. Dr. Moore still here? Yeah. Doctor, your wife still here? No, she just left. All right, two of, the, two of the most transparent people you're going to ever meet. And Sister Moore gave y'all some meaty stuff that was really transparent about who she is. And man, y'all underscored that like it's an everyday thing. Wow. Huh? Y'all need to give that sister a round of applause. I mean, because she put herself out there. And that's just who she is. That ain't, she ain't just come here to do that. Y'all ain't that important. They ain't come here to do that just, just, just for y'all. Couple disclosures. Let me tell you why you're really clapping. So, most people don't know. Dr. Vincent and I, and that's so great to be able to say that because I knew this cat when he when Dr. Vincent. We were in law school together. And uh, I had Professor Williams who's sitting over there. Now, the challenge was Dr. Williams and other people finished. I didn't, because I was busy making too much money, right? My challenge is I should have gone to law school outside of Columbus, Ohio, which is where I'm from. I probably would have finished, but I didn't. But I had great mentors like Professor Williams, who I didn't listen to, right? But I met some great people along the way, and here we are reconnected in this forum today. Ain't that kind of crazy? Ain't that kind of crazy? Stuff like that just don't happen by accident. Now, having said that, we're talking about um, international programs. And there are some people in the room who know my younger brother, Eric. Eric is uh, a part of leadership now, student life at, at Ohio State. And there are, I have f four brothers. He's the youngest. He's always that kid that's like the lucky star kid. You know, just wind up, right place, right time, all the time. So he's at Ohio State, gets his master's degree in sports management. The day he graduates, he meets the then president, uh, Dr. Gee, right? Who Professor Williams at that time, Dr. Williams was, 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 working, was working for. Doesn't know, doc, Dr. Gee doesn't know Eric from the man in the moon. Eric gets invited to go on the South Africa trip with Professor Williams and the basketball team. The very next day. Gets a job while he's in South Africa with Telemundo. 
moves over, lives over there for a year and a half, changes his life completely. All because of that man right there. That's why you're giving him a round of applause. It's about being connected and being in the right place and being of service. Second disclaimer, some people in the room know that I have a daughter who's a senior at Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio. She's majoring in sports marketing. She need a job, y'all. <laughs> Selfish promotion. She come out May 14th. I'm taking all names. I brought pretty cards to give you so you can stay in touch with me. Help a brother out. Y'all got it? Here's the third one, and then we'll move into it. So this is why you always kind of have to be careful about where you are and who you are and what you're doing. So Dr. G, phenomenal presentation, agree? We ended up, agree? Yes. We ended up sitting next to each other at lunch today. Didn't know him, didn't know me. Heard the presentation. Now here's a full disclosure. So the fellas in school days, that was me. Spike Lee and I were classmates. That whole piece was based upon my crew. Never knew Dr. G was going to bring that up. So I'm sitting in the back cracking up. I said, he has no idea, <laughs> right? And let me tell you, Spike gave y'all a sanitized version <laughs> of the stuff we did. But you just always have to be kind of careful. So as Dr. Vincent shared with you, how many of y'all HBCU graduates? OK, so did y'all get that speech when you first went in, look to your left, look to your right? So for those of you who don't know it, let's say that this is our freshman class right here. Teddy McDaniel in the room? Yeah, he know. Uh, you go into freshman orientation, and you have to understand the entering class is usually, I don't know, maybe three, four, five hundred cats. Everybody was like valedictorian and salutatorian in the class, so you coming in top didn't mean a thing, right? Everybody bad boy in the class. So the dean would get up and say, look to your left, look to your right. Do that, shake hands with the person next to you, and he said, listen, you need to understand that two out of three of y'all ain't going to make it out of here in four years. Now, that's sobering, because everybody thinking, ain't going to be me, right? Ain't going to be me. I graduate top 5% of my high school class, right? Two out of three of you are not going to make it out of here in four years. Took me 21 hours to graduate my last semester. Right? Because I was that school days cat. 21 hours, right? Had a fairly successful athletic career. Uh, was in Division I, but finished uh, number nine that year in the nation in terms of uh, assists. It helped that I had a roommate that shot the ball a lot, so all I had to do was basically pass the ball, pass the ball to him. Uh, but, you know, had a fairly successful career. But, but, you know, just didn't get that balance between scholarly and academic pursuits. And they, even as I fast forward, now that was 1982 when I graduated. Even as I fast forward, it's a shame that we're still dealing with those types of issues still to this day, right? Now, I didn't end up getting out there because I was so smart, but I had strong um, community involvement. You know, at the time, I had an athletic uh, director, uh, McAfee, who was not going to let me fail, wasn't going to happen on his watch. Um, I had a uh, religious professor. I don't know if Dr. Watson was still there uh, when you were there. Um, so I heard somebody ask the question in terms of what can professors do. You got to care. You know, it's not one of those situations, at least for HBCUs. Um, I'll pull this out because y'all got to understand that if my daughter calls me, I answer the phone no matter where I am. Right? She's 21 years old, so I answer the phone no matter where I am. She might need me, and I got to go, and I have to leave y'all here. So, <laughs> um, so Dr. Watson I have for religion. Now, I'm captain of the basketball team. We're doing pretty good that year, Teddy. So I missed Dr. Watson's class. Didn't really think I need Dr. Watson's class, right? But I'm a cat that needs 21 hours to graduate. But I figured Dr. Watson going to give me a pass. He know I got to graduate, right? I'm laid up in the bed. Alone, Dr. Vincent. I was laid up in the bed alone. <laughs> Figuring, who could this be at 9 o'clock in the morning, right? It's a Tuesday morning. I said, I'm supposed to be in class. Don't nobody know I'm here. Open up the door. Guess who it was? Dr. Watson. Dr. Watson just looked at me and said, young man, I'll see you in 15 minutes. I was there, right? 
but it gave me a different perspective on what, what a commitment to student athletes meant. He knew I needed the 21. He didn't have to come and get me, right? But he did. Dr. Watson, so from a professor's perspective, he was one of the persons who made sure that I got it. And then I was always one of those kids who was fairly active in the community. Dr. Moore asked a question about isolation. That's a two-way street. And a lot of times, you know, I thought about when I got asked to do this community forum piece, and, and you know, I've been known for, for being kind of radical, but um, we can really kind of get caught up in terms of just talking to ourselves. Discussions rarely lead to solutions. And as academicians and as, as, as professionals, we're always looking for that solution-oriented thing. We're always looking for the transaction component of it as opposed to being transformational. Because transactions give you an end point. Check that box, keep on moving. Transformation means there's still work to do. And a lot of times, we don't like to do that. Right? So I had uh, a couple people in the community. One was a, uh, a pastor at the time who said to me, who put it probably in a perspective where a 21-year-old kid could get it. He said, uh, knew I played basketball. He said, Adam, every time, he said, I had some Nike sneakers on, whatever they were at the time. He says, nice sneakers. I said, thank you, Rep. He said, when you bought those sneakers, or when the team purchased those sneakers for you, and they put the money up for the sneakers, did they walk out of the store without the sneakers? I said, no, I got, I got them on. He said, that's the point. The point is, every time you don't get it, or when you don't graduate, when you don't move forward, somebody's already paid for that young man. And what you're doing by not following through is that you're leaving money on the table. Well, I'm a, I'm a capitalist at heart. <laughs> he got my attention. And so from that point on, I understood every time I was late, every time I didn't make a meeting, every time I didn't negotiate the hardest that I could, right? I'm doing what? Leaving money on the table. And that was the piece that really helped me push forward. And so what I've been asked to do is essentially kind of give this community perspective, but I want to do it a little differently. I want to, you know, who's here that's not connected with the university, doesn't play sports, but just as, as a community person other than Teddy McDaniel? Anybody? What do you do, man? Financial planning. Okay, this, this is going to be great. It's going to be, y'all understand, it's not going to be a monologue. It's going to be a dialogue, right? Because it's a discussion, right? So what I'm going to try to do is offer compassionate critique. I'm going to talk to you through the community's lens, not from what y'all used to seeing. Let me start by giving you just a real quick story. And in fact, um, I think the last time I was here, I kind of told this story because it helped shape my framework in terms of community engagement at every level. So in Columbus, Ohio, the business, uh, where's my brother from, from OSU? <laughs> From OSU. There he is. Y'all know the Buckeyes are strong. Oh, I ain't scared of none of y'all. I don't care what y'all say. Y'all know the Bucks is, right? OH what? Okay, man. All right. Man. Don't be scared up in here, man. So if you're from Columbus, then you know my family's business is kind of the business of religion. That's, that's, that's what we do, right? I'm kind of like the white sheep of the family. I'm the capitalist on the other side because somebody got to figure out how to pay for their retirement plans, right? That's, that's what I do, right? So I'm at the church one day. So I'm heading up the church's Community Development Corporation. I pull up. We have a nice little turnaround. We have a fairly large church for, for Columbus, Ohio. It's about 5,000 plus members. My brother is the pastor. One of my brothers is the pastor. And so uh, my sister-in-law is pulled up to the church. She's unloading some boxes. And so I'm downstairs. I put some stuff down because my intention is to help her unload the Jeep, unload the boxes. When I put the stuff down in my office, uh, the exec, my brother's exec, comes over the PA system and says, somebody has just broken into Sister Troy's car, right? So I rush up the steps. Now, we're not a suburban church, right? <laughs> we are an African-American, black, Baptist church all the way in, right? So I rush up the steps, break out the door, and I see a young man running across the street. So if this is, this is a side street the church is on, Teddy, this is Cleveland Avenue, and some housing projects across Cleveland Avenue, which is one of our busiest streets. Now the interesting thing is my brother, who is six years my senior, who is the pastor, is on the third floor, I'm coming from the basement, somehow, Greg, he beats me out. I still ain't figured that out to this day, right? 
He beats me out of the building, and I see him. This is like straight out of cartoons. Everything goes in slow motion. I see him chasing this young kid across the street. Kid dodges cars. My brother dodges cars, right? And I'm watching, but I feel like I'm moving in slow motion. So the kid gets across the street, jumps the fence. My brother gets across the street, jumps the fence. And I'm thinking in my mind, wow, he still kind of got it, right? <laughs> so there's a house about where that wall is. And so they're going this way. So me, with my educated self, I figure I'm not going to go this way. I'm going to go this way to cut them off. So I run this way. I get across the street. There's a cat who was probably sleeping back there that comes around the corner who's not the cat, but I don't know he's not the cat, right? So I end up clothes-arming him, figure out, oh, he's the wrong dude, right? <laughs> so he's just laying there. At that moment, the guy who, who, who broke into the car appears. So I'm standing here. We're about this far from one another. And my brother, Scotty, is about right there. So I'm figuring, okay, cool, this is about the end. You know, my brother's here, I'm here. We're about to fight, figure out what it is. And it turns out he had a cell phone. You know, that was when, like, you know, cell phones was a craze. He had my sister's cell phone. And so as we're approaching him, he steps back and pulls his shirt back. What do you think he had? Gun. So I'm saying, man, I'm about to die out here for a cell phone? That, that just don't work. <laughs> that just didn't make sense, Dr. Moore, right? But here's the thing that got me. At that moment, he says, back up, you don't know me. So he says, back up, you don't know me. My brother and I, being both educated guys, back up, he has a gun. We don't go back into the church, call the police. Police come. Two hours later, they have a young man in custody. Turns out, young man lives six doors down from a 5,000 member church in a prostitute house. What's the story? 6,000 members, fairly progressive church. And he has the audacity to tell me we don't know him. And that's what I'm saying to you as community. Easy to sit in Ivy Tower. Easy to make up excuses that you don't have enough time. Nobody ever said this was going to be easy, y'all. I spend a lot of time right now in Detroit, Michigan. A lot of time in Detroit. Anybody here from the D? When the last time you've been back? A week ago. So you know about the street lights, right? So I'm called a year ago. One of my partners is the CEO for the Public Lighting Authority. I'm going up there a year ago to look at a real estate deal. He says, man, I'm going to put together some meetings, but I really need your help. It'd be the same thing if Dr. Vincent called me and said he really needs This is somebody I've known for like 20-something years. So I go. What he needed at that time, so here's how you have to understand Detroit. You know, Detroit was bankrupt, right? Did you know at one point in time, Detroit was the wealthiest city in the world? I didn't know that, Professor. Wealthiest city in the world. At its height, 88,000 street lights. 88,000 street lights. When I got there, one out of every four. Has anybody seen the Citibank commercial where they're talking about progress makers? If you see that, the guy that they're talking about on there is Otis Jones, that's my cat. So, one out of four. First time I had been any place where I had driven through entire neighborhoods that were completely dark. A lot of stuff we take for granted, but I mean entire neighborhoods that were just completely dark and been dark for decades, right? So the challenge for the relighting of the city was to go to Wall Street and raise $160 million because the city was bankrupt, so they couldn't afford to do it. So the state created this public authority, put the state's credit behind it. Y'all with me so far? Put the state's credit behind it because nobody was going back, back roll Detroit. Go to Wall Street, instead of raising 160, we raised 185 million. 185 million. Come back, put the lighting initiative in place. The goal was to put in place 64,500 street lights, as opposed to 20 something thousand working. Had, here's the politics of it. Eight year plan. New mayor gets elected. Cool guy. Love Duggan. One of the quickest studies out there. Says, hey, here's the political reality. My term is up in four years. You got to get it done inside of four years. Eight year plan, got to get done inside of four years. Right? As of last week, I told you the goal was what? 64,500. As of last week, we're at 60,000. We'll be done almost a year in advance. Right? You can't get that kind of thing done without knowing the community. 
You can't get that kind of thing done in terms of being apologetic because Miss Jackson, who's been without a light for 20-something years, she don't care how tough it is. She just want to know when you're going to have my street light, right? And so what I'm saying to you is that I've heard some great uh, conversation today. And this is the sort of thing that absolutely should be supported. Absolutely should be supported, physically and financially. But you have to understand, and what I'm trying to tell you is don't get discouraged. You have to understand the community don't see any of this. The community is that same cat that brandished a gun on me and my brother and said, back up, you don't know me. So you have to figure out what you're going to do. What are you going to do at that stage? I'll leave you with this, and then we can engage. Because I want to hear from you. Why are you here? What did you hear today? And hopefully what you're going to do tomorrow that changes. If, if, if this goes away tomorrow, what are you going to do to make things any different? Mythical bird, bird in African history called the Sankofa. Anybody know who the Sankofa bird is? Dr. O, you can't answer this. You, you're supposed to know. Yes, ma'am. You know I'll take that. Any other? Any? Yes, sir. Go back and get it. It's the literal translation of that. So the Sankofa bird in African lore was a bird who could stand in the present. If you ever see the symbol, his feet, its feet, is facing forward. Body facing forward, but the head is turned backwards. Right? It literally means that you have the ability to stand in the present, face forward, but also not forget where you came from. A lot of times we do that. And that's what that young man was essentially saying to me and to every other institution. Lots of money, lots of people, particularly for the African-American church, here's a question becomes, other than creating parking problems on every Sunday, what you doing? <laughs> so you have to ask yourself as professors, as practitioners, even as student athletes, what is the impact that you're having? Somebody said it, uh, the lieutenant colonel, he's probably gone. He said one word, the whole thing was, was, was great, but he said one word that stuck with me, service. Man, you can have degrees out the wazoo. You can have money out the wazoo. But man, for us as a people, and for anybody in this room who's connected with us as a people, you have to understand our livelihood is about service. Sankofa in mind. Put yourself in the shoes of the Sankofa. Talk to me about what you heard today, how it's going to change what you do tomorrow. Anybody? This is time for best practices. What did you learn? No wrong answers. Dr. Vincent. Okay. Um, so Dr. Vincent knows that I don't really like to talk about uh, the success of my company and what I've had, but that's why he's asking me that question, because he's going to force me to tell you all that. So um, I'm in the real estate business. It's a finance major, economics minor, right? Um, and I didn't translate the success. So, so let me go to the end and work backwards. I've made a ton of money, a lot of money. I used to sit around and think sometimes I made more money in a year than my grandmother, who, who was a day cleaner. Y'all know what a day clean, cleaner is? You know, clean white people's floors and houses than she ever made in her lifetime. I paid more in taxes than she ever made in her lifetime. That just, that just blows my mind because it's not me, right? It was understanding the ability to monetize relationships, but also, and here's the key for me. I'm a preacher's kid. I come out of a preacher's family. And oftentimes, what we don't do as a community is simply leverage the access to the religious community that we have. Listen, the religious community is the only place where people show up every week and no notices go out. If you're in marketing, you should be saying, man, can you imagine how, much, how many dollars I could put back in my budget and I ain't got to spend that on getting people to come to, to, to a product, right? And so the church for me became a proving ground to just try stuff. At the end of the day, I don't care what business you're in. It's about market share. If I got a hot dog stand over here, and you got a hot dog stand over there, and my hot dog stand is getting 30 people a week, and your hot dog stand is getting 30 people a month, what hot dog stand are you going to invest in? 
It's that simple. My church was 5,000 people. Who won access to those numbers? Financial planners. Tell you about a quick story with, with uh, Amer do you work for American Express? Okay, tell you a quick story. <laughs> it's good, it's all good. <laughs> Healthcare experts want it. Banks want it. Insurance companies want it because it's transactional. It's units. What we don't, what we don't do early enough as professionals and what we don't teach young athletes, which they have to, so at Ohio State, have the women's basketball team and the men's basketball team basically come twice a month. They don't have to, they just volunteer twice a month on Wednesdays to come and serve community dinner. Packed out. We don't try to recruit people to church, but they just take it upon themselves to come and serve. You know what that gives them? Connection. So if they ever get in trouble with the Ohio State University, right, the university can't just swing on those athletes because they have to deal with us. It's one thing to swing on a star athlete. It's another thing to swing on 5,000 people who ain't got nothing to lose. You got to at least think about it. You got to at least think about it. That kind of leverage, and I love Maurice to death, could have helped him several years ago. If you don't understand nothing as a student athlete, you can't go to war with an institution. It doesn't work that way. Not by yourself. But you can create a dialogue to sit down with the community, leveraging who it is, to simply open up the discussion for you to be able to move through some uncharted waters. So the church for me represented the first platform for understanding how to build my business. American Express Financial Advisors and Black Enterprise. Black Enterprise wanted to increase its amount of publications that it was putting out there, right? Black Enterprise Magazine. American Express Financial Advisors wanted to get more units, more black people to sign up to do financial plans. I'm seeing how many people a week. Okay, now you have to understand, I have no official role at the church, love that, right? Because I'm just like a renegade, right? I can just always blame stuff on my brother. So, American Express comes and, and Black Enterprise comes, and they see I have these numbers. So, I say to them, now I'm over the Community Development Corporation, Ted, and here, here was a way to raise money without doing chicken dinners or special offerings. American Express has a foundation. Because American Express said, listen, you know, we have this policy on the American Express side, we can't give directly to churches. That's okay, you have a foundation. And I'm not the church. I'm the Community Development Corporation. Separate board, separate 501c3, separate books. Even separate name. Ching. Now we have mutual ground we can work on. So what was the number? I had them donate $25,000 a quarter, $100,000 in the course of a year. And put three people on staff. That was, that was huge money, right? What did I give them? I gave them access to a segment of the population that typically is marginalized because nobody sits around the dinner table because of our history and talks about the importance of what? Financial planning. And at a discount rate. So we're halfway through the program. We got a few hundred people signed up in the program. And I don't have a good perspective on, on, on the business. I don't know if we're doing well or we're not. I just know, you know, we got a lot of people and I'm always pushing that we should be doing more. So I call a meeting and I say, listen, how we doing? Now they got two financial planners assigned to us, right? So I said, I'm sure we could probably be doing more. I'm thinking, man, we about to lose this grant, right? And have money. And here's the important thing. I could take those monies and I could send kids on trips that the church didn't have to raise special offerings for. I could do child care. I could underwrite Women's Day. I could underwrite Men's Day, right? So the, the head guy says, Adam, the average, if you're worth your salt, financial planner gets about 40-something units in the course of a year. So I'm, I'm sure I probably had like this puzzled look on my face because that didn't register. He says, think about it this way. There's 52 weeks in the, in the year. And he says, if that person is signing up one person per week, that's pretty good. Now, I got a few hundred people in the program. So now, I'm bad boy. I, I know what I'm dealing with now, right? So the program explodes. Thousands of people. Here was my mistake. That's why I should have stayed in law school. <laughs> I'm a fairly decent marketing guy. 
So the name we came up with was the Community Wealth Initiative. That was the name of the program, Community Wealth Initiative. I didn't copyright the name. Black Enterprise, I love them to death. They took it and ran with it. So if you get Black Enterprise to this day and you open up the middle section, there is a whole program around community wealth building. That started in Columbus, Ohio, at New Salem Baptist Church with yours truly, who was too stupid to copyright the concept. But you imagine how many people have been helped from that? And so it was that model that I began to take and say, listen, I don't necessarily have to have money to put in a deal. I just have to control the market share. So we've done a you know, quarter of a billion dollars worth of real estate. If you want to do a CVS, going back to my hot dog stand, you want to do a CVS, you're going to come to the CVS that has access to 5,000 people who are going to go to that CVS because they know that the church has some involvement versus to the CVS that doesn't, right? So I got a CVS in the neighborhood I grew up in based upon that. We have a grocery store in the neighborhood I grew up in based upon that. We have a service station, a Tim Hortons, in the neighborhood that I grew up in based upon that. It's all about market share. And so what began to happen is that what you figure out is at a certain level, y'all, it's really not about black and white. It's really not. It's about how high can you go on the elevator economically. And how strong are you as an African-American or minority person to hold the elevator door open long enough for the rest of the people to get in? That's your job. That's your job. And so I had corporations calling because they wanted to partner. I had public institutions calling because they wanted to partner. I had mayors and municipalities calling because they wanted to figure out how to lessen the burdens of the resources that they had to pull out. Churches loved it because they got to leverage and monetize and bring new resources into those communities that heretofore wasn't sitting in the pulpits. And at the end of the day, you know, I don't necessarily get caught up in what your religion is. People just want to know, how can you help me? It ain't Republican or Democrat. It ain't black or white. If I'm in the gutter, all I want to know is, man, can you get me out the gutter? And, and your panel said it best. You know, athletes, they don't know the questions to ask. You know the questions to ask. So sometimes you do have to grab them by the hand and show them. And you're not going to always win. Right? But the ones you do make it will be hopefully cast a wind up like me to make it out and can look back and can begin to leverage opportunity for other folks. Fair enough? Okay. Anybody? Go back to my question. You're Sankofa. What'd you hear today? What'd you learn today? How will it change what you're going to do tomorrow? Y'all let Mr. Vincent put this conference on and y'all can't answer that because his, his money going to get snatched. Tell y'all that now. Yes, sir. You won't know without asking. I'm sorry? You won't know what you can achieve without asking. You won't know what you can achieve without asking. So you, have, so you have to ask the question. He was a young man that was six doors down from me. Nobody ever asked the question, what are, we do what are we doing in this neighborhood for some middle school kid that might be living in a prostitution house? Never asked the question. Yes, sir. Uh, what I learned, the brother from South Florida, Mose, I don't know if he's in here, but he said when they put their summer bridge, summer bridge, summer bridge, the bridge program, program. Together, uh, had weekly topics. He let them decide what they wanted to talk about. Mm. And so what it what it made me realize is that sometimes I'm imposing on them what I think they True that. know. True that. And maybe if we ask them what you want to talk about, they'll have more ownership. And sometimes just set the environment. So told you about the Wednesday community dinners. So we got a bunch of kids in our neighborhood. A lot of people in the neighborhood, probably not unlike many other African-American churches, most of the people nowadays that go to your church, probably 85% of them live in the suburbs. Am I right about it? Yes. Okay. So what we simply did, we have a little park across the street. We just set up Saturday movies on the back of a house. No agenda. You know what start happening? Kids start coming. They bring their little chairs, right, sat on the grass. When the kids start coming, guess who else start coming? Parents. Now there was something that was relational, that had the potential to be transformational, not transaction. Didn't tell them what we was going to do. We just started showing popular movies. Now we don't have to do that. That kid leads the whole program in our, in our neighborhood. So sometimes it is about asking the right question. Sometimes it's just a matter of setting the environment. Other thoughts? 
I know y'all, I was only here half a day and I heard some great stuff. Yes, sir. I think one thing I take away is that um, with all the different programs, the creativity from the programs, I saw one common theme, uh, extra investment equals progress for these athletes. Mm. Um, and that, that seemed to be a common denominator throughout. Yeah. Uh, if we take the time and invest extra beyond what's the, the standard norm, we can see uh, gradual progression and improvements almost seem like across the board. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, I will concur with that. And, and sometimes, because um, I'm not in the field, I'm just kind of reading up. And somebody used the acronym earlier today. Greg, it may have been you. Um, APR? Uh, man, I mean, if you begin to look at the um, negative impact that's having on historically black colleges, <sighs> 21 out of the 24 historically black colleges that are in Division I are potentially under suspension from post-game play. Man, that's huge. That's a hit on revenue. It's a hit on recruiting. It's potentially, if you begin to look at the penalties, you know, restricted practices, coaches being penalized. I mean, you know, a, a lot. so the point I'm trying to make is um, average won't get it. Ain't been getting it. And so you have to, you have to do that extra thing. And typically, y'all, as a people, you know, as long as we know where the bar is, we'll typically get there. If we know where the bar is and what the rules of engagement are. So you can't approach it with the same old formula. Dr. Watson could have been an average cat who let me sleep in. Him coming across the street knocking on my door at 9 a.m. in the morning absolutely was extra. Right? Absolutely was extra. What else? Yes, sir. Got to ask the right questions. Um, help set the right environment. And sometimes we have to go the extra mile. Yes, sir. Hey, how's everyone doing today? My Wonderful, name, man. My name is Hunter Phillips. I'm actually a student athlete at Alabama State University. Congratulations. And what I actually took away from today was competing. This actually, it occurred to me when I think the guy from 24 Hour Fitness, he came up and he ta started talking, started talking about the three C's and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And that really something I took away just because someone that was overlooked in the recruiting process coming out of high school, someone that you know, it was hard trying to make that transition freshman year, leaving no doubt. So I just think that was probably the most empowering thing that I took away from today. And hopefully that, I can carry that for the rest of my life. So uh, give me a round of applause. Critically important. Can I underscore that a little bit? Because sometimes as, as a people and as athletes, we only like to compete when the lights is on. So I told you I was on the basketball team at Morehouse. Let me tell you I got the basketball team. So I was actually scheduled to go to Brown, right? Ivy League school, show you how shallow I was. They took me up there for college visit in the wrong month. It was just too damn cold, man. I didn't know nobody. I was on that hill. And I was like, Teddy, I was like, mm, I can't do this. Can't do this. So I didn't go. I had made up in my mind, listen, <laughs> i move on to something else. The other challenge was I had gone to the Morehouse Spelman homecoming when I was in the ninth grade, and that had left a pretty much indelible impression on a young man way back then. I'm sure that had something to do with it, and I knew that I couldn't get none of that up in Providence, Rhode Island. But anyway, so I go to the gym, you know, I'm just, and there's some guys in there playing. And I'm just messing around, you know, I'm just messing around. We have a good game, I'm just messing around. And, and uh, uh, the guys who were playing on the team, I didn't know they were on the team because I didn't know anybody, right? So I'm just going and messing around. So I go back to Hubert Hall, my dorm, shower. Hour later, knock on the door. Wasn't Mr. Watson that time, but knock on the door, open up the door, it's the assistant coach. So anybody ever been to Morehouse's gym? Well, the old gym, what we call the nightclub. Okay, so <laughs> the nightclub, how, how much time I got? Was, was, okay, I'm good. So, you know, you have the basketball surface down here, and the, and the coach's office was like in a crow's nest. You know, like it overlooked, kind of like, you know, the plantation that you're overlooking, you know, down. So they could see out, but you couldn't see in. And that's why we used to call it the nightclub. Plus, there's like no windows in the gym at all. When you're in there, it's just, you know, it's just dark. So they were watching. 
Assistant coach comes down, says, um, got my name from some, some of the cats, and says, listen, like the way you play, we were watching you, want to offer you a scholarship on the spot. Now, that was important, because those of you who know my family, I got a younger brother who's two years behind me, and my family really could not afford for us both to be in school at the same time, but we didn't know how that was going to work out, but faith worked it out. So that's how I got on the team, right? But had I just been in the gym, not doing the best I could do, right, I might have still been at Morehouse. <laughs> Y'all got to lighten up, man. <laughs> Life ain't that serious. It ain't. What else? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, um, ma'am. Is this on? Oh, yeah. Oh. So um, I think it's good to see so many best practices of programmatic interventions that include intersecting identities, where we're really giving student athletes an opportunity to think about their gender, their religion, yeah. their race, their whatever status they want, their graduate student status. Um, when I was a student athlete, I was an athlete on the field. <laughs> And, and a student in the classroom. Yeah. There weren't too many opportunities where people were engaging me about, okay, so what else are you? Are you also a daughter? Are you right. also this? So I think it's really good to see that because our society is growing so much and the literature is changing and we're thinking about, you know, even to see so many very strong black men in leadership positions talking about their religion openly. That was not something I experienced as a student athlete. And it's really encouraging to see that you guys are so bold with all of your identities, your status as a military man and all of yeah. it. It's been good to see that because I haven't seen it before at any place I've been at. Good word. Good word. When, when I first got here, there was a young brother who stood up over here and talked about um, being intentional about uh, the definition around manhood. That went by a lot of y'all as well. Man, that is critical. Oh my God, it's just critical, right? And so in order to do that, you've heard people say, you would do better if you what? No better. So if it hasn't been modeled in front of them, right? Most of the time they don't know. So as those who are progressive, as those who have been educated, as those who have been some places, sometimes it's just a matter of putting them in the environment. There's a brother, um, MJ, is that his name that was on the panel? He, is he still here? Yeah. He's working on it. Oh, beautiful. Uh, so we, you know, we just engaged outside, and I think I was at lunch. And so I was just sharing with him when I found out what he was doing. So I come from a family of all males, no sisters, right? So uh, my youngest son, my youngest son, my only son, um, just graduated from Morehouse in 2013. So he's the fifth one of us to do this. So it's an important thing. Goes to Penn, because we're not a family. I don't try to live through my kids, right? So I'm figuring he got an opportunity to go to Wharton School of Economics. I'm hyped, right? We go for the visit. He's on campus for 15 minutes. He says, Dad, I ain't feeling this. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? What? <laughs> so some counselor, at, you know, private school kid, some counselor says, listen, Miss Oramus, and, and she was the first, this is important, she was the first white woman who I ever met who knew more about HBCUs and specifically Morehouse than I did. And I graduated from the school. But what she imparted on those kids is that don't get caught up in the hype. This is where you're going to spend the next four years of your life. If you get into an environment and it doesn't feel like you, doesn't feel like you can grow there, right? Not a place you, sh you should go. I didn't know he was going to believe her. But anyway, so anyway, we come back. He applies to Morehouse unbeknownst to any of us. Ends up getting in does well. Where was I going with that story? What was the question? Oh, so, so five of us, so with that knowledge, a couple years ago, we create a Troy Ambassadors Institute, just based upon the family's experience. And, and the notion was, we took 25 middle, middle school kids, all African American males, some hard knocks, some middle of the road kids, some high achievers. And the premise was, if we put them in the right environment, that they would do better in school. 10 weeks, uh, funded by the Ohio Department of Development, I think 20 grand or something like that. During one of the weeks, we actually took them to Washington, D.C. Uh, and New York to a point you raised early. Some of those kids had never been out in the neighborhood. Some of those kids had never been to, we had them keep journals. That's the other thing that athletes don't do, right? Y'all know who the number one user of Twitter is? African Americans? Because we don't like to write. We don't like to write. That's not a racist statement, it's a racist reality. We will tweet your behind all day long. Ask me to write a full sentence. <laughs> Got to change that. So, so we made him keep journals. I'll never forget a kid kept a journal, and he described the locking mechanism 
from going, you know, when you take the little plastic key card, it goes red, yellow, blue. He had never seen it before. He thought it was like Star Trek. And it just let me know that kids who have not been exposed, they will never do better because they haven't been exposed. Those of us who know have to expose them. Can't put them in an environment. It's like a kid being pushed down, an African-American male. He's seen nothing but violence and, and uh, negative activity for 18 years. And when he comes to college, you expect him to grow up and be a responsible African-American male. Doesn't work that way. Time is up. Time ain't up, man. 5.30. It's 5 o'clock. It's, it's 4 o'clock. Where do y'all get these people who can't tell time at, man? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> One last thing. Any, any last thing? Beautiful. Y'all been great. Thank you for allowing me to improvise. Thank you, Dr. Vincent and the university for having me.